Several years ago, my friend Zach helped me record a video about PCB manufacture while he was studying to become a chemical engineer. Now, he is a chemical engineer working with the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory on a really neat new nanomaterial, and he was able to arrange for me to come by and do some experiments with it. The new nanomaterial is PolyLMN, which is short for Polymerized Liquid Metal Network, and it's a strange new nanomaterial. It's got some crazy properties, like it can be stretched and it's conductive, and it doesn't follow Poyer's law, which means that when it is stretched, it doesn't really change resistance much at all. The thing that I was most interested was to find out if this material could be used to make stretchy transparent circuit boards. And as you're probably guessing from some of these clips, yes, yes it can. We started about two weeks beforehand, so I designed the STM32F042 board here, and it has USB. I designed an ESP32 board with Wi-Fi, this pass-through board, and a backstop board. The idea is that we would clamp the PolyLMN on its substrate between the backstop board and whatever board we wanted to test with. We made the pass-through board to test the interface because that was what I was most worried about. But in the end, it really wasn't that bad. The interfacing became even less of a problem after we started experimenting with different types of interfaces. We started with a NIG, this gold finish, then we moved to Hassel, which is just a lead finish, and then we tried solder bumps. When designing it, we didn't already have specific tests that we wanted to run in mind, so I just routed some touch pads and some GPIO pads and the I2S bus to some of the pins that would be available to the substrate. Michelle had developed this technique of using a laser cutter to make these pattern masks, which she could apply to the VHB tape. Once the masks were applied, the poly LMN could be deposited to the VHB tape and the whole mask. It could then be baked in an oven. The mask is then removed to reveal this beautiful pattern poly LMN circuit board thing. But it's not ready for use yet. It needs to be activated. Their preferred method of activation is stretching, and it made me really uncomfortable to see the degree by which they would do this. So this is what the material looks like after it's been sprayed on, and it's actually gray because the material itself, all the little balls, are sub-micron, and so they're just scattering light every which way, so it appears to be this pale gray. Now, what's interesting is, after it's been activated, and you look at it closely, you can tell that it was activated successfully because of these tiny little balls that have formed on the surface. So whereas before, all of these individual balls are all in uh, electrically insulative between each other, now what this has done after activation is made it so the entire trace is conductive. And you can see some of the, the little metal balls that have risen to the surface. Now this won't always be that way because you could pre-encapsulate beforehand and that would prevent the, uh, the balls from uh, from like forming like that. But still, the idea is that you can see that you go from a trace with all of these nanoscale insulated balls from one another, all the way to something where the entire trace is now filled with this conductive liquid. There were still some defects on the boards. We could use alcohol if a trace was bridged, or a blunt object to force activation if it needed it, or if we really needed, we could just add additional liquid metal like Watson is doing here. The next step was to place the components on this weird VHB nanomaterial, I guess, circuit board at this point. And all we really did was we took the components and put them down. They stuck really well and even made stable electrical connections. Even things like carrier boards. When we placed this carrier board with the WS2812 down on it, even when we stretched the material, it all stayed connected really well. Go. So polymerized liquid metal networks are called that because they consist of little droplets of our liquid metal, which are linked together by these polymerizable units here, and you can see the schematic crosslinks. Although the particles start off insulating, when you link them together and then pull on the entire film utilizing those links, the particles rupture and the whole film becomes conductive. And because you still have the oxide shell which was there in the first place, the liquid metal is retained close to where it was and you can stretch it and return it without a penalty to resistance. Oh yeah, the first demo. So this one is standalone now with an STM32F042. And uh, yeah, I know it has the USB port. We're not using it though because we can just simply detect buttons and have it shoot up. Neat little uh, LED thing there. And it is the amount of pressure you apply, it makes it brighter and brighter, so. That's cool. Oh yeah. Yep, yellow and cyan. cyan. Purple, purple. And if you change the amount of pressure difference between them, you can get other colors. Yep. Sweet. So I guess 
encapsulate the top and we'll rock and roll. We tried different encapsulation techniques. They all had different levels of success and application. Even though poly-LMN is safe, non-toxic, it can get messy and still stain things pretty badly. We started trying different encapsulants. So for example, this one was PDMS and you'll see one of the problems that we ran into with it because it doesn't stretch quite as much as the VHB. All right, should I try? How do we reset the, uh, the, the threshold? The threshold. Uh, it's the auto, it's the little, here, the little white auto button. Oh. Cool. Should we go further? Sure. Uh-oh. Oh, uh, there is the PDMS! Oh. The carnage! The carnage. Let's see, it's still, it's still operable. Just the uh, top, just the top layer came off. Overall, we had better success with thermoplastic polyurethane, or TPU. And although we didn't get to try it in fabric, TPU is something that can be embedded into fabrics. Yeah, okay. Watson, can you uh, tell me what you are uh, about to do here? Okay, so I have these test sensors that are embedded in this TPU uh, material, and so if we, and each, each of these test sensors activates different colors of the LEDs, and I'm just going to fold them on top of each other, which you can normally not do with standard circuit boards. And if you do, you fold the two sensors on top of each other, you get the mixture of the two, just as if you were to touch the two separately. Though many of the details surrounding the manufacturing process are outside of the scope of this video, these scientists have published their findings and go into a lot more detail in their published works. I've linked some of the papers below. But for right now, let's just take a look at some of the more basic processes. Because we're making polymerized liquid metal networks, we start with, well, liquid metal. And this liquid metal is indium and gallium, which makes a room temperature eutectic. And this is added to this other container with the material in it, which will kind of help facilitate the entire process. It's then placed into a sonic bath to tear apart all the oxide layer off the surface of the material onto this stirrer in order to break apart the pieces into really, really tiny blobs and then back onto the sonic bath to complete it, making the blobs even tinier yet being able to tear them apart to be, well, nanoscale. Now that the particles are really, really tiny, the fluid can be used with an airbrush and applied directly to whatever surface it needs to be applied to. With a nice, even, thin coat, the poly-LMN dries pretty quickly, and even faster with the aid of some creative time-lapse video editing. Though this week was an absolute blast, it wasn't without its troubles. Zach and Watson and Michelle are still learning how to use the material and make it better and more robust and come up with better processes for using it. And as such, we spend a lot of time troubleshooting boards and understanding how to fix things and, and well, even had some mystery failures that we never really figured out, like when we tried to use a time of flight sensor. But it was still pretty great and we got a few really awesome projects out of it. One of the most fun projects was when I used the STM32F042, a processor which doesn't have wireless, to, well, make a software-defined radio signal down at 40.6 MHz in the ISM band. And then I used an RTL-SDR to tune to it and listen for FM. I hope to make another video soon about how I commandeered a lot of the hardware inside of this microcontroller in order to abuse it to actually generate wireless signals because it's a lot more powerful than you'd expect. We can and we can touch the, uh, the button and actually send a tone out. So let's turn up the volume here a little bit. So if I touch this... Like the other project earlier, I used the touch sensing hardware available in the STM32 to detect when a button was pressed. I then used the internal RC oscillator in the PLL to synthesize a 40.6 MHz signal, which I output into this sort of poly LMN loop antenna on the VHB. So I was able to actually send the signal entirely, well, software defined, and have it broadcast using a poly LMN trace. You might notice that I actually placed the touch button inside of the loop antenna, and this was a miserable failure, and I don't recommend it for anybody. But it did kind of work. It was able to detect when I had, say, the button that wasn't inside the loop antenna pressed and modulate on an FM signal and broadcast it out through the poly element trace on the VHB.
One of my observations, which didn't make any sense, was that as I stretched the circuit, the center carrier frequency changed ever so slightly. And it really shouldn't be possible based on the design. I still don't quite get it. Stretching the, the LED and the resistor stay pretty well stuck to the board. Uh, I don't really know why that's happening. That's really strange. Let's, uh, let's go look up at 80 megahertz. Because there's another spur up at 81. Let's see what that does. So I'm going to... Hmm. Oh yeah, that's that's really sensitive. Huh. Oh yeah. So if I stretch it. What about um? There's a note. Hey, right here, it completely goes away. Versus if I go back, it comes back. This really shouldn't have surprised me that much, but it did. I was detuning the antenna, changing its RF properties by being able to stretch it and bend it out of shape. But I think it's really cool that there's a, a length that we can make this antenna where the signal disappears. <laughs> we can just make the antenna big and get rid of a certain frequency in what we're doing. Oh my gosh, this is so ridiculous. Ah. Uh... There, it's almost completely gone, and now it's back. Look at that. <laughs> oh, that's so weird. All right, here is my last project I did. So it's a little ESP32 using one of the earlier uh, Liquid Poly L&M boards. Um, so it is still stretchable. Actually, uh, Zach, if you're up for a... Uh, or somebody can stretch it while we, uh, I didn't even think about this. Somebody can stretch it while we're looking at it. The neat thing is this is a little ESP32 right here, which is serving up this web page, And it is using a, like my custom IP stack. So it's really nice and fast. I shouldn't touch um, your keyboard. And we can pull that up right there. Uh, you gotta bring it up some more to what? see it. Um, and we can actually see in real time the, uh, the sort of like traces in the, but you can see like the LEDs remain connected while he stretches and because the resistances are about the same, like I can still come in here and touch the, uh, the touch sensors and so this bizarre. thing still works. Uh, also like with this, I can also control kind of like the LED colors, which I don't oh. know, I think is kind of fun. <gasps> Did I disconnect that one? Oh, there we go. No, you didn't disconnect it. I'm just messing Oh, you turned you. it off on me? Yeah, uh -huh. I turned it off. Uh, uh, that's not cool. All right. It's cool, but it's not cool. Yeah, so this was a uh, fun little uh, thing here. Okay. Zach and his team are going to continue working with the AFRL to develop these materials further for future use as stretchable conductors and circuits. And they're hoping to make sample quantities available in the not so distant future. So feel free to check out their articles in the description and reach out to them if you feel their research is pertinent to your field. As always, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future updates. Thanks for watching.